is we like to be curious and we are curious about the natural world and we have our conservation research and community um, science projects that help us monitor those things and kind of get better understanding of them and also um, participate in helping those some of those animals get to safety and that's the salamander brigades which is right on fire right now lots of salamander and frogs going on now so that's a little bit about the Harris Center and I want to just say that all of this is possible because of support from people like you and if you're interested in finding out how to be a supporter of the Harris Center or volunteer or get more involved you can check us out on our website so that was a lot of chatter now we are ready are we ready for ask a naturalist people i'd ask a naturalist all right this is a poll here we go so you're going to be able to respond we live in peterborough blocks from downtown my husband wants to feed the birds i don't want to attract bears or varmints what's your recommendation gloria so miles what's our poll So you can just answer and the choices are, how do you feed the birds? I don't feed the birds, nature will take care of them. I feed them only in winter. I feed seed in winter and sue it all year long. I feed birds all year long. I am not afraid of bears. Sure, we've got a uh, 21% that don't feed birds at all. Most people are feeding them in the winter, 52%. Um, and then a couple people will feed them, 24% feed them all year long. Wow, that's great. Um, so this, this falls a little bit in under my court because it in, involves varmints like rodents and rats, which I saw Rosemary has some rats that she doesn't care that she feeds them even though, and we have some bears. So, um, yeah, I mean, if you feed the birds, you're not just feeding the birds. Um, you are feeding the things that eat the seeds that drop from the birds. And that includes mice, chipmunks, squirrels, rats, all sorts of rodents, flying squirrels, um, and some bigger things too, like bears um, in particular. So. I would say, I'm gonna ask Phil, because this is also partly in Phil's court. Phil, do you have a recommendation about bird feeding at this time of the year that you would like to share? Yeah, this answer could get me in some trouble uh, with New Hampshire Fish and Game. Uh, so there are, there's a lot of information that comes out in the spring about, uh, you know, the bears are out, it's time to take your feeders in. Uh, but a lot of people genuinely just enjoy feeding the birds and don't want to stop when there's so much activity and bird song. So I'm guilty of that. I don't take my feeders down for the year on April 1st as Fish and Game recommends, but um, we've been lucky and, and also careful and make sure we do take our feeders in at night so we're not feeding bears. Um, when it comes to other, other varmints though, um, certainly um, we, we have skunks and, and uh, foxes come by um, so I guess you have to find a balance that works for you, but that doesn't mess with the natural world. And you, you don't want to feed a bear uh, for obvious reasons. You, you don't want to get a bear accustomed to feeding at your feeder. And sometimes other critters can become a problem as well. So um, really getting good baffles goes a long way, keeping, um, keeping the critters away from those feeders, especially the squirrels and things that can climb poles like raccoons. Um, I don't actually feed all year, as somebody asked, um, but I, I do feed hummingbirds in the summer. And I think somebody else mentioned that too. So there are ways, good poll like, like the Harris Center has that is you know more or less bear proof. I know bears have um, can get a little crafty and sometimes can take down feeders even when we think they're safe. So you know finding a way to, um, to critter proof your feeders as best as possible is a good solution and you know, go with, go with nectar in the summer for hummingbirds. Bears will rarely get into that. Um, sometimes though, um, you know, if you're feeding sunflower, they, they will go for that all summer long. So I'd say if you have to pick one seed though, uh, and then one strategy, go with sunflower until, you know, mid-May. And I feel like the feeding activity really stops at that point because it shifts to the breeding bird season. Most birds are going after insects at that point. 
so yeah, this this is um, the next part of this. As you can see, this is a picture of somebody who has a bear at their feeder. And um, I enjoy watching birds at my feeders. Last year, I had a black bear destroy a sunflower feeder very close to my house. April 1st is the date recommended for removing feeders and I'm ready to take them down. Is there any bird seed I can leave in a feeder that won't attract a bear? So I can answer this, the answer is no. There is nothing, no type of seed that will not attract a bear. You, I like to think of bears as, as a friend of mine and wildlife biologist, head of Fish and Games Wildlife Biology Department. Mark Ellingwood once described a bear as an animal with a tremendous sense of smell attached to an enormous appetite. And they can smell for miles away and they will remember your feeder. They are smart. And so if you feed them, they will be like, I will check that feeder again. I will check that feeder again. And that's when you really have a problem because you might have a bear that gets accustomed to coming to your feeder. And a fed bear is often a dead bear. So what I would suggest, um, you can see online, there's lots of advices, put red pepper on your feet, on your seed, that won't work. Put ammonia and vinegar on the ground, that won't work. Um, the bears right now, when they're waking up, from um, the winter, they are starving. They are starving. They have lost a huge mass of their body. And so when they're coming out, some of the females will have given birth and they have been nursing all winter long. They are really hungry and there is nothing that you can put in your feeder that they won't eat. So I would recommend, especially during this time of the year when the bears are really hungry and there isn't a lot of wild food for them to eat, to be pretty vigilant about taking your feeders in every night. That doesn't mean that you won't get a bear at your house in the daytime because they're that hungry that they will be out and about looking for food. And um, my best advice to you is if you want to feed the birds all year long, get an electric fence and fence your feeders in and fence it wide because um, bears will, they will learn an electric fence. They will pay attention to it. Um, so if you really dedicated to bird feeding, invest in an electric fence. That's my suggestion. Phil, do you have anything you wanna to add to that? Yeah, a lot of what you said already. Um, yeah, just if bears do start to come during the day, you definitely wanna stop feeding. So. Uh, but good call on the electric fence. I know people who do that, it works really well. Uh, it's a little bit more work, but if you're serious about feeding and don't wanna stop, go for it. Great. All right, let's see what we got. I know we have more questions tonight. We have a packed program. So hopefully Miles will be able to advance the slide. I think it's just taking a while. Oh, it's just taking a while. Oh yeah, this is from Jim and Fitzwilliam. He says, our forests are dying or are they? It makes me sad to see so many and such a variety of trees that are sick. What's going to happen to our forest? Jeremy, this falls right onto your court. Can you can you respond to this? Sure, uh, this, this is a, it's a great question and it raises a lot of interesting points and we could spend a whole hour on this and, and I'd bore everyone to death and I don't want to do that. So I'll talk about a couple aspects of this, um, but I'm actually going to come from a more optimistic standpoint that in general, our, our forests are, are pretty healthy. Um, but there is some mortality that, that, that's problematic and that's mostly associated with invasive species. So right now we have two major issues with our forests, um, one being the hemlock woolly adelgid, which has been around quite a while, but it's a, it's a piercing sucking insect that attacks eastern hemlock and over a period of about four years will kill the, will kill the trees. Um, that's, that's been in the region a long time and it's causing a lot of problems. Uh, the other one is the emerald ash borer, which um, is a, uh, um, a bark beetle that attacks ash trees of all, all varieties and, and tends to kill quite a, a high percentage of them. And so those are sort of abnormal mortality events because they're associated with species that have been imported by humans um, that don't have natural predators in this region. And, and, and that's really problematic. Um, but 
general mortality in the forest. So like we're seeing in these pictures with, I think this, this might be a red maple that's died to the right. And, and then the previous one, I think it was a yellow birch perhaps. Um, mortality in the, in the forest is, is pretty, it's both common and it's, and it's an important part of the ecology of the forest and we wouldn't want to eliminate it. You can sort of think of um, the, the, the resources that are available for trees as being, they're, they're finite. That is to say, there's a certain amount of sunlight that's hitting that area. There's a certain amount of nutrients that's in that soil and there's a certain amount of water that's available for those. And all of those are for critical for the, the, the plant's survival. And if um, that, that amount can only support a certain amount of, of, of plant biomass on the site or tree biomass on the site. And so as some trees, as trees grow, they're gonna come up against that limit of what, what's supportable. And so there are gonna be trees that are, uh, are losing the race, the competition for sunlight in particular in this region. And those trees will slow in growth and then become more susceptible to things like fungus and bacteria or, or a, a whole variety of other pathogens that will attack them. And so you'll get mortality associated with those trees. Uh, in forestry, it's called self-thinning mortality. Uh, it's also called density-dependent mortality. It's, it's mortality associated with trees that have lost the competition for the limited amount of resources that are available on that site. And it's a, it's a completely natural and completely expected part of forest development over time. And so seeing some dead trees in the forest is, is not just not problematic, it's actually a good thing. It shows that the forest in general is growing um, and some of them, to, to, to make space for those trees that are growing, some of the trees are, are dying on the site. Um, anyway, we could go much, much deeper into this and there are, there are certainly pathogens and imported pests that cause problems that are, are outside of this sort of natural mortality of the forest. Um, but- All right, thank you, Jeremy. In, in, I just wanna, in general, our forests are, um, relatively helpful, healthy at this point. There are certainly, there are certainly things that are, are on the horizon in terms of, of the climate and, and, and other aspects that are uh, gonna, gonna take their toll on forest health, but in general, the, the forests are very healthy and seeing a dead tree is not a problem. Great, thank you so much, Jeremy. And now we have a turn the tables poll. We are going to play an audio clip and then there will be a poll for you to um, respond to what you think it is. Miles, are you ready? Can you hear that? All right, here's the poll, poll launched. What is this sound? A kill deer, peepers, baby chicks begging for food, bees buzzing, person whistling. Here, um, peepers was by far the, the most popular answer. And indeed, that's what it was. That's great. Maybe we could have Brett or Karen um, want to talk about why are they peeping so much? What's the peeping about? Yeah, so I'll chime in. Um, you know, for many of us, that's the sound of spring. And peepers are interesting because they're often heard and seldom seen unless you're out on these first warm rainy nights when they're migrating to wetlands. Um, the reason that they aren't seen very often is that they're very small. So a full grown adult peeper will only be about an inch and a half long. So it's quite remarkable that they make such a din. And that's, um, those are all male peepers <laughs> who are setting up territories uh, and defending those territories and, and singing to attract a mate. So they find a, um, they call typically from emergent wetlands like cattails or, or other grasses and wetlands and uh, they find a spot that they think is particularly good and they, they perch there and call out and females will select um, the males to mate with based on the intensity and, and duration of their calls. And they can call um, remarkable amount of times. I think I read one statistic that was like 3,000 to 4,000 times in an hour, something like that an individual peeper can call. So it's all like most, like most sounds that animals are making in the spring, it's all courtship related. Wow, Brett, I once read, it was, a, it was in Ranger Rick, so I don't know. I mean, I read that um, 
of like regular size um, kind of area where you would hear peepers, like a regular average size peeper pond um, could produces enough energy that it would light a city block in New York. Have you ever heard anything like that? I haven't heard that statistic, but I did hear that they've been recorded, the decibels have been recorded. I think it was something like 120 decibels, which is akin to a rock, like a like a rock hammer, uh, like a, what is it, what are this called? A jackhammer at close range or a really loud concert. So it's pretty amazing that, an, that a frog that's an inch long can, can create that level of sound for sure. Wow, love it. Thank you so much for telling us. And that was a fun poll. Here's a question from Tony. I am wondering what this fungus is. I found it growing on rotted logs on a recent walk in Marshfield, Mass. Fungi man, John Benjamin, do you got an answer for this? Sure, Susie. Uh, uh, so we have a pretty well decomposed mushroom here. Whenever you find something this far along in its decomposition, it's a bit of a crapshoot what it was. So I can make a guess about this one. I definitely can't guarantee what it was. Uh, but, you know, it sort of exemplifies this this challenge with identifying mushrooms because they have so many different appearances at stages of their development. They're, they're ephemeral reproductive structures that have their their own, um, you know, life cycles. And with some mushrooms, they'll, they'll appear and send out spores and decompose within even a week or, or two. And some last for a lot longer. And this mushroom is one that lasted into winter, which gave me a pretty good uh, clue about what it might have been, as well as the sort of arrangement of how big it looks. And again, this is totally a speculation, but my guess is this might be a decomposed Berkeley's polypore, uh, which is a very interesting sort of uh, very large uh, uh, mushroom that will grow uh, from the base of oak trees. Generally, it's a uh, parasite. It, 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 you know, the mycelium will infect living oak trees and other hardwoods as, as well, and actually really cause some damage and kill them ultimately sometimes. It's a butt rot fungus, which I know, Susie, you're a big fan of that term, so I thought I'd throw that out there. Uh, so often, you know, causes the, the um, deterioration of the hardwood inside from the roots and, you know, the, the interior, um, you know, part of the tree. And uh, so you'll often find it growing in the, the late summer and into, into the fall from the base of oak trees and other trees. And it's a really cool mushroom. I mean, you, you can Google it if you want to see what it looks like when it's fresh, Berkeley's polypore. And um, it uh, has these big sort of radial kind of lobes, kind of whitish, tannish looking. And believe it or not, I mean, those of you who know about mushrooms a bit, it's kind of an interesting mushroom. It's actually in the Russula family, uh, which is kind of weird. It's not a polypore at all. It, like they did genetics tests on it and rustulas are those cool little, you know, very common mushrooms in summer and fall that are often pink or reddish on the caps and white underneath the gills. But this, this, this is not a gilled mushroom. So it just goes to show you get these weird little evolutionary outliers when you look at the genetics of mushrooms. And um, I mean, these are tough mushrooms. So they, they don't decompose quickly, which is why this was my my big guess of what the identity of this species was. And they can sometimes take a while to, to break down. They're not, they're not like other poly, true polypores that will grow for multiple years and continue to produce spores and be active. They will, you know, have their, their yearly cycle and then send out spores and break down. But that's my best guess. I was super excited because I looked at that and that's what I thought it was. And the only reason I thought that was because I took John's winter fungi course um, and he's such a great teacher and keep your eyes on our pop-up calendar. We're going to be offering, what did we decide to call it, John? I don't know, Susie. What did we decide to call what, it? What was it? What would we get to call Brett? What was the name? We have a good funny name for our mushroom club. It wasn't Loose Morels. What was it? Oh yeah, it was Loose, Mor Loose Morels Mushroom Club. Um, it's coming your way and we'll be, um, we'll be putting that out. It should be a lot of fun. All right, on to this very cool track. Um, this is, we encountered these animal tracks on our recent trip to Plum Island and we're not sure who left them. Our guess is a skunk, but these look like only the hind feet. They were about two to three inches long. Thank you, Adelia and Madeline. Um, so I, I love this little thing, this little track over here. Um, I love that they were on Plum Island. That's one of my favorite places to go. And they were right. Um, it is a skunk. And part of what we're seeing is just the hind feet, pretty much, of the skunk walking. And they are the sizing matches. 
Um, skunks are usually resting during the coldest parts of winter. Um, and around here, they kind of wake up around uh, Valentine's Day, but out on Plum Island, it might be a little bit earlier. And part of the reason why only the hind feet are registering, and that's not that uncommon, is that's where the weight is more and the foot is bigger. So it's gonna leave a bigger imprint. Skunk tracks have five toes on the front feet and five toes on the hind foot. Um, their hind feet and front feet will have claws. The claws at the front are really long um, on the front feet. That's because they use them for digging up the food that they eat. They're omnivores. So they're eating a lot of stuff that they're digging around in the ground, grubs, insects, berries, roots, fungi, things like that. So um, this is a little skunk track and, and I love that they sent it in. And for me, if I saw that in January, at the end of January, I would know winter was almost over. All right, oh, these are so beautiful. One can eat these, right? I think I remember that from a walk with folks from the Harris Center years ago. This is from Lilla and Karen. This looks some, like something right up your alley. What are these interesting plants? Yeah, I love things. These. They're so cool. They they really stand out in the forest because of their color. Uh, this is a plant, and it's it has a few different common names. It's sometimes it's called Indian pipe. Uh, sometimes it's called the ghost plant or the ghost pipe um, because of kind of its shape. Um, its scientific name is Monotropa uniflora, and sort of what that means is it's a a plant that only has one flower at the tip of each stem. And um, these are interesting in their classification. They're actually in the same plant family as like blueberry shrubs, the Ericaceae, but um, they are a plant that's very atypical because they don't perform photosynthesis and hence the white coloration. They can vary. Sometimes you can see these in their uh, a rosy pink color because they, they do uh, some, strains are capable of producing certain pigments, but they don't actually have the genes to produce chlorophyll. Uh, so they can't carry out photosynthesis. So there's a few heterotrophic plants. You might know like a Venus flytrap or a pitcher plant that are actually predatory plants. This is a parasitic plant uh, that actually uses an intermediary. It actually uh, uses a, a fungal intermediary to uh, parasitize other plants, typically trees. Uh, so many trees have what's called mycorrhizae, which is a, a mutualistic association with certain species of fungus that permit a tree to, to gather more nutrients. And these uh, plants use the mycelium of the mycorrhizae as the, the interloper to actually steal sugar molecules from the tree that's associating with the mycorrhizae. And John mentioned Rustula mushrooms earlier. And interestingly, that's the fungal species that this uh, plant uh, affects. It, it's only been known to associate with that particular uh, mushrooms group. Um, so it's really interesting. They have a really wide distribution. It's found pretty much everywhere across the United States, except for the Southwest. Typically find them in uh, the forest floor of moist, shady uh, forests. And because they're non-photosynthetic, they can really survive in, in places that are, are really low light environments. Um, so it's a super interesting plant. Uh, it's called a mycoheterotrophic plant. Wow, thanks, Karen. That oh, was all. Just one thing about edibility. They are edible to this question, um, but they are commonly confused with fungus and many fungal taxa are uh, potentially toxic. So like always be very cautious and think about, do you actually really need to wild harvest? Um, sometimes it's better to left, leave them undisturbed so that they can continue to propagate because these are perennials. Wow, that was great. Wow, uh, John, have you ever eaten these? I asked John because he, he eats a lot of wild harvested things. You no, know, yeah. I, I never have tried these and I, I've read about them being edible and there are uh, some cautions about their, their consumption. Apparently uh, they're not like a uh, choice edible with no concerns and they're delicious and that kind of thing where you just really want to seek them out. Um, so I haven't tried them, so I can't speak to their tastiness. 
All right. Well, all right, here we go. Um, let's check out this slide so you can see some tracks in this slide. And then, Miles, let's move to the um, slide with the comments on it. I think it's the next one. So we have some slides, some tracks here. These are the same type of animal tracks right here. So here's this, this is the statement. We found these tracks one morning. They went from tree to tree to tree. The critter went up the tree, came down, then went to the next tree. Our property sits in the middle of a lot of wild land and is located on a quiet rural road. We see critters all the time. We've seen bobcat, opossum, porcupine, fisher, cats and fox in our woods within a month of these images, which I think were taken in mid-February. We also heard bobcats at night and this line of tracks crosses exactly where we have seen the bobcat crossing our driveway. We've identified fox footprints, but fox don't climb trees. And this continuous line of tracks seem to be root from tree to tree to tree. Any thoughts you have would be appreciated. We've had a lot of fun finding and documenting this little story. Now we need expert help to solve the mystery. All right, so here's some more. And I, um, this, I love this mystery. It's right up the alley, my alley um, this winter when I was focusing on this critter with my students, my fourth grade students. Um, and just the description of going from tree to tree to tree and going up the tree might make some of you think you might know what it is too. And if you're thinking squirrel, you are actually correct. And squirrel tracks are very commonly mistaken for something more exciting, but actually squirrels are really, really exciting. Um, that little kind of um, looks like like a diamond in the snow, that's their front feet and their back feet kind of registering in the same moment. And the space between them is the leap. The fact that they're going up the tree and down the tree is also another great indication that it's squirrel. And the hole that's dug um, that the tracks go into is where the squirrel cached or put its acorns in the autumn. And so it's refinding them. And squirrel, the gray squirrels have a remarkable ability to cache hundreds and hundreds of acorns and remember where they cache them all winter long, which is pretty awesome. And so um, this is really important species to have gray squirrels in their habitat that they describe where they have all those other animals because squirrels make up a really important part of the food chain for things like bobcat and foxes, especially in the winter when some of the other animals are harder to get to because they might be under deep snow or icy snow. So um, maybe it wasn't as exciting an answer as you were hoping for, but it was squirrel. All right, here is turn the tables. We have a turn the tables poll. All right, Miles. <laughs> okay. So we are listening to, you might have heard like a woof whooshing in the background, but the sound that we're really hearing is that peat sound. And here are the choices chickadee. Tufted titmouse, woodcock, Phoebe, or kazoo being played on the full moon. Okay, Miles, what do we got for our results? This this audience is with it. We've got um, ninety one percent with the vote of woodcock, and what do you know? Uh, that's what that was. That's cool. Hey, Phil, tell us a little bit about what we're hearing there. Yeah, so this is uh, pretty exciting. This is happening around you this week. Um, if you go out tonight after this talk, everybody should make sure to go out and, and listen right around 7, 7.15. The Woodcock males, like you're hearing here, will start its, uh, its display. So they do a, a ground display that consists of calling. That's the male making this really strange vocalization coming out of its, its uh, syrinx. Um, but it's also, uh, it, that little popping sound is, <laughs> what was that? Uh, that? That little popping sound before it is, um, is kind of like sucking in air before, it, I, I don't know how to explain that, but that is part of the call. Um, and um, when, when the woodcock uh, goes into its full display, in the air, they do this amazing aerial display flying up several hundred feet, uh, trying to impress females below. 
So the males will arrive first on breeding territories. That's what's going on in the month of March or early April around us. Uh, a couple of weeks later, the females will arrive. They'll um, be out displaying in these breeding grounds, uh, which are generally large open fields, um, close to wetlands, close to brushy woods, uh, where the woodcocks will, will nest. So they need that proximity of large fields next to um, wet woodlands. Um, so if you have that configuration of habitats, go out, take a walk down your road tonight and, and listen for them. So the males will do this amazing flight display if you haven't seen it. And it gets hard to see, but you can hear it. Uh, the wings twitter in the air, and that's, that's a spectacle all on its own. That's cool. All right, we have another poll. Tonight is very interactive. All right, this is really interesting. Here's, here's the setup. More than once, I have seen this in my backyard. My critter cam happened to capture the squirrel carrying a snowball, which I share with you as a short clip and a still. What's going on here? We have watched the squirrels carrying the snowballs into the tree. Water supply for the nest? Okay, this is not a doctored photograph. This is from Ruth. An Antrim, and we're going to set the poll. So you're going to try and answer, why is the squirrel carrying the snowball? To have a snowball fight? To make a tiny snowman? To store water in its nest? It's not snow, it's a cotton ball. Squirrels are strange. <laughs> in the video to play, it looks as though the main winner was to store water in its nest. So um, this this obsessed me for about a week when it came in, um, came to my desk because mammals. I had to consult Mead Kedo whenever I come to a, a mammal question that I'm stumped by, I always go to Mead. And he was a little stumped too. And then I actually even emailed uh, Joe Merritt who wrote a book on small mammals. He's a friend of the Harris Center. He didn't get back. He must be busy studying some small mammals somewhere. Um, the best that we could come up with between Mead and myself was, yes, it might be storing water in its nest, but maybe not because to turn snow into water um, takes a lot of energy for a little body. And to have a whole snowball in a place that you're trying to keep dry does not seem like a, that good an idea. But one thing that could have happened is if it was really sticky snow, which um, we did have quite a bit of kind of snow that gets stuck together really easy and almost like cement. And I did shovel some snow like that this winter. Um, when the squirrel is digging up its acorn that it cached, it might have, the acorn might have gotten stuck in the snow. Have you, has that ever happened to you? You drop something in the snow and you go to get it and, and then all of a sudden, like the thing you dropped is in the middle of the snow. That's happened to me with little like money or my keys once. Um, so Mead and I think that perhaps more than anything, of course, what drives a squirrel is food um, and they're really good at getting it. But if their acorn got stuck inside the snowball, um, it might need to um, get the snowball out. But Phil's saying that maybe squirrels are just strange. This, I checked everywhere on the internet. I was like, is this like a phenomenon that other people are seeing? What I came across was lots of people that make snowballs with acorns inside of them or seed inside of them and get the squirrels to do funny things with them, like pick it up like they're holding a snowball and they're gonna throw it. So I'm sticking with my thought that I think there's a piece of food inside of there and the squirrel is, is getting it. All right, this is a fungi for John to identify, it kind of rhymes. John, what is this thing? It looks like a horse's hoof. Well, it sure does, uh, Susie. And sometimes that is one of the common names of this common fungus. This is a true polypore. Uh, so that means it has lots of tiny little holes where the spores are dispersed. And uh, this, you know, this family polypores are all the shelf mushrooms that are uh, famous. There's lots of very uh, well-known varieties, uh, reishi mushrooms and artist conchs. And this is often known as the tinder conch mushroom. That's what I often call it by uh, for its common name, though it does look, look a bit like a horse hoof. And uh, sort of referring back to the last mushroom question, this is another mushroom that is past its... Uh, viability. It's no longer sending out spores. It's, it's, it's a dead mushroom, basically, even though the mycelium might still be living. But perhaps, you know, this is a small strump, stump. It, the, the whole organism might have run out of nutrients here. This could be a remnant of a, 
the past. You know, it's hard to know exactly if the mycelium is still alive or not when you see signs of mushrooms uh, that are dead. But in this case, you can see some holes in this mushroom that are signs of some kind of probably larva burrowing into it. Sometimes you get woodpeckers even pecking into these mushrooms if there's, you know, insects inside. Uh, so, you know, it's part of the cycle and there's all kinds of things that can use them for energy eventually. But this is definitely no longer a living tinder conch. But tinder conchs are super cool and very common. Polypores, you see them all over the place. They're very common uh, wood decomposition fungus. Um, so they're breaking down the lignans in dead wood. And, um, you know, they're, they're really a good one to know about. And sometimes they can be a lot lighter in color, kind of uh, tannish in color, even whitish with stripes. And, uh, I mean, get the, get the name Tinder Conch because in the olden days, they were used as a pretty good way to start fires or even carry fires. You can actually use the internal uh, materials from these mushrooms to, you know, you can scrape them out and have a pretty good kindling for your fire or even carry burning embers in a fire from one location to the next and over multiple days, you know, and then have a really quick ignition source for a new fire. Uh, so that was, you know, a source of life or death and, you know, for people in, in earlier times. And uh, my friends and I tried this one time and we had it going for like uh, two and a half days in a big tinder conch. And then our boss told us to put it out. So it goes for a long time. Uh, and, and lots more you can say about it, but it's a cool mushroom to know about. John, I just want to, I just want to double check. That's the one that Utsi the Iceman had. I was going to mention about that. Yeah, they yeah. also have antibacterial and antimicrobial properties. So they've been used medicinally. You can make a, a, a material called um, Amadou out of it that can be used to make fabric and, you know, sort of a, a clothing. So this is a really cool mushroom that has a long standing relationship with humans and a lot of um, different cultures around the world. Wow, I want an Amadou shirt. Could you I mean, imagine? You might, might have heard of Paul Stamets. He's a famous mycologist, and he has he does these TED talks, and he wears his Amadou hat that he made. Yeah, so I've it's seen pretty that. cool to see. All right. Well, I wish we could talk more about that, but we've got other natural mysteries to solve, and this is one of them. Um, this sharp-shinned hawk perched on her feeder crook, then cornered two chickadees in a nearby blueberry bush while he she waited for one to make a break. I raised the sash and everyone escaped harm, except the hungry hog who flew to a nearby limb to consider its neck tact. The square tail and small size, similar to a large blue jay, were my clues that it was a sharp shin. Was I right, Phil? Yeah, I think Jim nailed that identification. That's And that's not an easy identification between a sharp shinned hawk and a Cooper's hawk, which is the slightly larger cousin um, those two confuse even the expert birder uh, quite often. They're a lot easier to tell when they're flying a mile away when they are perched right outside your window, believe it or not. Um, behavior cues is, is a good reason why when a bird is moving and it's flying a certain way, it has a more telltale identification and more straightforward. So when they're perched and not doing anything, that's when they can be really tricky. Um, but uh, generally, yes, the squared off tail edges is a good indication of a sharp shinned hawk. Cooper's hawks have longer central tail feathers, so it appears more rounded at the tip. Um, another clue for sharp shinned is the eye position, which you could kind of make out on that top photo, um, is more centrally located on the head compared to a Cooper's hawk, which is a little bit more forward facing. Uh, at least that's the appearance that it gives us. Um, sharp shinned hawks also have a more hooded appearance, a dark hood compared to a dark cap that um, Cooper's hawks will show. Um, I should point out this is an adult bird. Uh, the adults have um, a, a nice kind of a grayish blue back and, and wings uh, with a rusty red underside, which has this barring across the chest. Young ones are more overall brown colored and more streaky. Um, and one more note about the size difference. Um, so sharp shins and, and all hawks really in our area, uh, females are larger than males. So there is some overlap in size with sharp shinned and Cooper's hawk. Uh, so a sharp shinned female could be bigger than generally the larger Cooper's hawk uh, if the Cooper's hawk was a male. So no guess as to what sex this would be. Um, uh, but yeah, going after chickadees makes sense for a little sharp shinned hawk are also probably a little more common in the woodlands in the winter around us. 
Um, and, and lastly, an interesting fact about the evolution of these species is that, um, that that size difference in the male and female of raptors, um, you know, one major thought is that uh, that helps um, the species overall with, with um, resource partitioning, kind of sharing a food source. Um, if there was a lack of a certain sized prey item, uh, say the, you know, a chickadee, for example, if there were more blue jays or larger sized songbirds, the female could do the, the, um, the killing and bring food back to the nest. So they share the duties and uh, it helps to have different sizes for different sizes of prey. Wow, that's really cool. Thank you, Phil. And thanks for sending that in, Jim. And good work on identifying a hard bird to identify. Way to go. All right. Miles, what could be next? Real quick, as of the slide lags, I think there was a question about the call of the sharp shin versus the cooper. Is there any difference? Sorry, I'm trying to unmute. unmute. Um, a little bit of a difference, yeah. One is a little higher pitched. I think the sharp shin is, is higher pitched generally, but um, in breeding season, we probably will start to hear Cooper socks very soon vocalizing. I saw one today displaying over my house, so they should be starting to call soon. And they have kind of a, a loud uh, kek, kek, kek kind of call when they're flying around. Cool. All right, just what I've been waiting for. Some more poo for Susie, of course. I love these. Princess of poop, sister of scat. People call me all of that. Okay. <laughs> Um, this is some, this is some old crap. <laughs> um, I was going to say something else, but this is a family show. This is pretty old. It's pretty, I think you're right, Jim. I think it probably did spend the winter under the snow, but you can see that it's really furry. So, um, it's very furry. The fur looks grayish. Lots of animals are gray, um, but squirrel comes to mind for me when I'm looking at the scat. And it's um, that twist at the end, that long piece that has that very twist end, and then the pieces that are next to it in segments is very characteristically canine. But um, it's hard to tell if it was a fox or a coyote, and that might be because it's a little weathered. So um, it's really hard to get a good, accurate scale of it, um, of what it is. So I would just put it in the wild canine group. It's definitely not a domestic dog. It's, it's either a red fox, a gray fox, or a coyote. And I do know that there's a scale. I see Brett's telling me there's a hand at the bottom for scale. And that's true, but this is pretty weathered scat. So um, if it was really weathered, it might be a coyote. Um, and that's kind of what I'm leaning towards. It's, it looks biggish, so it's coyote-ish, but it's also kind of thin. So it's hard to tell if it's a red fox um, or if it's a coyote. So I'm just gonna say wild canine that had something very gray and furry. Thank you, Jim, for sending me some scat. Wouldn't be an ask a naturalist without some. All right, and now we are going to have, I think this is our last slide. And as it comes up, I just want to say that um, as we move into April for Ask a Naturalist, don't forget to send us your natural history mysteries. They can be photographs, video clips, audio clips, descriptions, things like that. We'd love it. And we love um, as spring opens up, maybe we'll have, who knows what, what will April will hold. But here's the last question for the night. This morning, we saw at least eight deer crossing our field together. We often see one or two deer together, or at the most three, but never so many before. Is there any reason for this? Many thanks from Sarah and Hunt. Sarah and Hunt, thanks for sending this question in. Um, assuming that um, when you say this morning that it was relatively towards the end of winter. And towards the end of winter is really hard for deer. And we actually had some pretty bad icy conditions that would have made it very challenging for deer to um, move. They're gonna slip on the ice and it's gonna be treacherous for them. They're hungry, they're tired, um, they're worn out. There hasn't been a lot of fresh food for them to eat. They are probably yarded up at this point in late winter at the very beginning of spring. And when I mean yarded up, what happens is when the conditions get hard for the deer, whether it's deep snow or icy conditions, 
um, and makes it hard for deer to move safely, they go to places in the woods that are um, thick conifers, usually hemlock in our area. And that is their deer yard. And the snow is less in those places because um, the evergreens kind of keep the snow off the ground as a little bit. So there'll be a little bit less of the snow and there's things for them to eat. They eat the, nib the nibble off the tips of the um, hemlocks and they'll eat the inner bark too. And that's kind of where they'll stay. So normally you would just see one or two deer together, but in late winter, you're seeing kind of a group of deer and they're really consisting of the females and they're young from this year and often the young from the prior year, particularly the females. So any kind of females that are related are going to gather up together and they're gonna yard up. And, the, and during the rest of the winter, at the beginning of winter, the females are with the deer that they gave birth to at the beginning of the year and their female offsprings are um, in habitat often nearby. The males, are singular, they're bachelors. Um, they kind of go off and do their own thing. But when deer yard up, a lot of times it's um, males and females together in that group. And so what I'm thinking you saw um, is some deer that are just coming out of the yard of yarding up for the winter and kind of um, beginning to stretch their legs. And that's why you see so many together. It could also be that there was very limited food and so they're gathering near a source of food. That's another option too. So this looks like oak trees. Maybe they're eating acorns on the ground. Um, if there aren't that many places for them to find food um, and this is a hot spot for acorns, many deer will gather there. And oftentimes you see this kind of resource gathering where, where um, deer will gather in one area where their main resources in more suburban areas where um, the resources are more limited. So you can see that, but I don't think that's what, we don't have that problem in Hancock, but it might have just been that there were a lot of acorns in this area and a lot of different deer groupings, family groupings came to this one spot. So two options. I hope that answered your question. And I think we might be done for tonight's Ask a Naturalist. And we wanna thank you all for coming, for sending us your questions, for listening to our answers, for playing our games, our polls tonight. And hopefully you enjoyed it and learned some things. Next, next month, there'll be a quiz, just joking. <laughs> um, but thank you for coming. Not really, there might be a quiz. Sometimes we do that. Um, see you all next Ask a Naturalist. I don't have my calendar, but is it, does any anybody on our staff know when's our next one? April something, Earth, something? Earth Day, April 22nd. It's the oh. Earth Day edition. That's a good reminder. Send us your Earth Day questions. We'll take any Earth Day questions. So see you all on April 22nd. Until then, keep being curious and looking out. And if it's a rainy night, take Brett's advice and don't drive unless you really have to, to keep amphibians and reptiles safe. And uh, happy days, happy spring. Thank you. Thank you.